Hi, I'm Dr. Andrea Labuti, and I am going to answer what is a brief history of autism. But I'd like to add a um, subtitle to that, and that is how looking back may explain why your child's future is bright. We've come a long way, baby. That pretty much sums up the history of autism. Our beliefs about the condition have evolved from uh, a subcategory of schizophrenia to the refrigerator mother theory, which was um, Mr. Bielheim, who uh, determined that unloving mothers cause autism, to our present day genetic predisposition theory. Now, this evolutionary journey has a very happy ending. So stick with me and see we are, where we are going based on where we've been, because it's not what you think. But before we go there, I want to talk um, about a story. I want to tell you a story about my son with autism and skiing. My own limiting beliefs about autism were challenged, and the outcome was one of my greatest lessons when it comes to autism. So every winter, since our little boys uh, were little, our boys were little, we would go skiing. And at around age four, we put them in ski school and we happened to go to a mountain that had adaptive ski lessons for children with autism. So my oldest son um, started off with these adaptive lessons and uh, things progressed with all of my children every year. And eventually my two youngest sons became black diamond skiers. But my son with autism was still um, limited, uh, going on the green slopes, which are the easiest. Sometimes he'd go on the blue slopes, which were the intermediate. And almost always he was going with the adaptive ski instructor. And um, one year my husband decided, you know, we're gonna venture, venture down the mountain together. All of us are gonna go down the mountain together. So he could get on and off chairlifts, so why not give it a try? So our first run together was one of the most terrifying days of my life. My son got off the chairlift, pointed himself down the mountain and took off. He didn't go back and forth. He didn't go side to side on the mountain. He headed straight down at full speed, really, really fast. My husband, a better skier than me, bolted after him, but he couldn't catch him. I stood at the top of the mountain shaking as I watched them fly down the mountain. I knew that the lodge was at the bottom, there was a steep set of stairs, and there was a parking lot. And there was a very uh, narrow, high traffic um, area at the bottom of the mountain. So I made my way down the mountain, fearing the worst. But then I saw my son lying in a huge snowbank, laughing hysterically. I took one look at my husband who was completely terrified and I was convinced that he was gonna faint right then and there but my son was fine. He escaped somehow. From that day on, I believed that he was just too autistic to follow the rules, to fully grasp the safety issues that um, went along with skiing. But my husband had a different idea. He decided he would teach our son to follow him down the mountain and stay in control at all times. Good luck, I thought. I didn't want anything to do with that plan. I was terrified for life, I felt, after that first experience. And I just did not believe it was possible. After all, he was very autistic. So fast forward one year, my son with autism, and I do wanna add here that he appears very autistic when you meet him. Um, one year later, he was skiing black diamonds with the rest of us. And I could go on any run I wanted with him and we would ski together safely every time. Now the distinction of being very autistic is important here because it was defining what I believed was possible for my son. But the exhilaration and gratitude I felt at the top of the mountain just one year later is something that I'll never forget. You know, beliefs are powerful, powerful catalysts. And I really like this topic about the history of autism because when you look at the appalling theories that have been attached to autism over the past 100 years, you can see the evolutionary path of our beliefs about the condition. Schizophrenia, refrigerator mothers, I'd venture to guess that there was no hope or potential attached to autism when those theories were in vogue. See, beliefs define our experiences. They define our expectations. Beliefs define our children's potential, not because their potential is limited, but because what we believe about our children is what gets passed on to them. Our beliefs become their beliefs about themselves. Now this can be really good or it can be really bad. Here's another story. 
my mentor, one of the founding fathers of the biomedical movement, treatment movement, was Dr. Sidney Baker. And um, I would uh, be invited to see patients with him in his private practice. And I sat alongside him as he interviewed parents and children with autism. So one mother came in and she was lamenting about her child who was an eight-year-old and he was still in diapers. And he would have a bowel movement, he'd reach into his diapers and then he'd smear feces all over the wall. And without giving it a second thought, she'd go get her cleaning supplies, quickly clean it up and shrug it off as, you know, that's just the cards I've been dealt. Well, Dr. Baker said something to her on that day that completely changed how I approached my own child with autism. He said, Smearing feces is unacceptable under any circumstance. There is never an occasion where that behavior is okay. He went on to describe how her beliefs that it was his autism causing the feces smearing and her low expectations that were in fact the culprit. He continued, children rise to the level of our expectation no matter where we set the bar. If you set the bar low, your child We'll stop at that level, but set the bar high with the right compassion and encouragement and your child will rise to that level. So with that advice, the mother left with a new agenda. It was like she was given permission to want something more for her child and it was okay for her to have an expectation that would benefit her child that was in his best interest. So how would he ever form meaningful relationships if he was smearing feces in the presence of others? Not possible, not likely. So in follow-up several months later, the mother did in fact report that he was out of diapers simply because she was given permission to look at this differently. Our understanding of autism continues to undergo dramatic shifts in what we believe about this population. Where children were once considered mentally ill alongside this, those with schizophrenia, new information is being discovered that disproves our limited views on the intelligence and potential of these individuals. The history of autism shows dismal beginnings and the tragedy mindset associated with the diagnosis is a direct result of this, I believe. But emerging modern day information will change all of that. So I'm gonna go through a chronological history with you quickly. So 1908, Eugene Bueller, a Swiss psychiatrist is the first to use the term autism and he relates it to a group of symptoms related to schizophrenia. 1943, Leo Connor, the American child psychiatrist, describes the term autism um, after writing a paper about 11 autistic children, uh, described them as highly intelligent but having a strong desire to wanting to be alone and insistent on repetitive re repetition and routine. 1944, Hans Asperger, an Austrian pediatrician, describes a milder form of autism uh, where children are highly intelligent but socially inept with obsessive interests. The term Asperger's takes shape at this time. In 1967, this is my favorite, not my favorite really, psychologist Bruno Bettelheim populates, popularizes the refrigerator mother theory that blames mothers for causing their child's autism because they're not loving enough. Well, let me tell you something. I know a lot of people that by that definition should be autistic and they're not. 1960s, Bernard Rimland, Bernie Rimland, one of the founding fathers that worked with my uh, mentor, Sidney Baker, publishes Infantile Autism, the Syndrome and Its Implications for Neural Theory of Behavior. Now this was the groundwork for research in um, the physiology and biochemical aspects of autism and things that we could do um, to help kids physiologically. Bernie Rimland was a true pioneer and very loved in the autistic community. 1980, infantile autism is listed in the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. The condition is officially separated from schizophrenia, finally. 1988, the movie Rain Man featuring Dustin Hoffman portrays um, a, an autistic individual and raises public awareness. Now, despite the public awareness stereotype that autism was just like Rain Man, but still raised awareness. 1991, the United States federal government officially classifies autism as a special education category. 2007, the intense world theory, a unifying theory of the neurobiology of autism is published in Frontiers in Neuroscience. I love that 
um, article because it talks about the opposite of what we believe about autism, that they are hyper aware, hyper aroused, their brains are hyper connected in terms of their abilities to experience their environment and they are shutting down because it is too overwhelming. Super important in how you approach a child with autism by understanding that. 2013, the DSM wraps all of the subcategories of pervasive developmental disorders and autism under one term, autism, autism spectrum disorders. In 2014, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control cites the autism rates are 1 in 59 children. Now, if you look at a timeline of autism rates, 1975, 1 in 5,000. 1985, 1 in 2,500. 1995, 1 in 500. 2001, 1 in 250. 2006, 1 in 110. 2008, 1 in 88 kids. 2010, one in 68 kids. 2014, one in 59 kids. Huge. But it's not all negative, folks. Here are some positive trends. In the two year, uh, in the 2000s, so in the last, say, 20, 25 years, a new term takes root, twice exceptional or 2E. This describes high intelligence and giftedness of many diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. 2E schools and new approaches honor this diverse population. That is so important. A new approach to gifted but challenged kids. Strength-based approach. I highly recommend you look into 2E or twice exceptional. In um, you know, uh, later 2010, maybe a little bit before, a little bit after, many nonverbal autistic individuals are writing books, finding their voice, communicating, and what we're discovering is that what is on the outside is not what's going on in the inside. These kids are highly intelligent, but their bodies are not cooperating. So um, basically what we think we knew about autism is completely wrong. So here are my predictions as we evolve further. The unique strengths and value inherent in every individual with autism will be the focus on reaching this population as opposed to the deficits model. No longer will we force conformity at the expense of neurodiversity and its profound benefits to humanity. So remember this, autism equals neurodiversity, not tragedy. When we shift how we approach these individuals, we will discover their strengths and potentials. Let's raise the bar. Okay, the tragedy mindset is a thing of the past and it comes out of your beliefs and how you approach these individuals. So the history of autism has evolved from the dismal to the hopeful. The future lives of those with autism can be profoundly affected by how we view this population, especially as it relates to their intelligence and their potential. I am here to change what the world believes about autism. I don't think it's a tragedy. I think there are many different ways that we can approach this population. And if you like my answer, my website, which is andrealabuti.com, A-N-D-R-E-A-L-I-B-U-T-T-I.com. Uh, lots of information um, that will help shift your views about autism. Thank you for listening and have a great day.